Hi viewers, welcome back to your second video blog here with MSCSA. We have a special guest, Rich Williams, a higher ed uh, advocate for the U.S. per United States Public Interest Research Group. Um, today's topic is student debt. Uh, Rich, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm excited to have you on here. So, um, so why, um, why, why have borrowing rates increased for students? You know, um, I think we can all agree that higher education is practically a necessity in the 21st century, but as we all know, it's getting harder and harder to afford. Uh, and a lot of it is because uh, as states are in economic problems, they're pulling back on uh, financial assistance to higher education institutions, uh, which is causing them to make up more of their revenues through tuition, and that's the increases in costs that students and families are seeing. So that increase has caused more and more families to rely on uh, borrowing loans in order to pay for college. So actually just looking back uh, about 15 years ago, uh, only about a third of college students needed to borrow a loan in order to graduate, um, and those who borrowed had an average debt of about $12,000. Okay. Now over two-thirds of students have to borrow in order to graduate, and those who borrow have an average debt load of over $26,000. So here in Minnesota, as you know, it's uh, one of the it's in the top three for the most amount of student debt, and that number can come with serious consequences. Okay, yeah, twenty twenty six thousand. It seems like oh, quite a lot there. So like, I mean, so why why does this matter in the first place? Why is student debt so important? Why is it well, you know, some people might look at it and say, well, hey, you know, twenty six thousand dollars. If you're going to be making more over the course of your lifetime, maybe not. It's not that bad. But we have to remember we're having graduates come out of college against a backdrop of you know college costs skyrocketing. Um, family finance is basically staggered, stagnant over the past uh, decade, um, and just this uncertain job market, so it's harder to get a job. So with loan payments due as soon as six months after you graduate school, possibly before you even have earned your first paycheck, um, you're in a very financially vulnerable situation. So many students or many graduates are finding their uh, loan debt unmanageable, and that comes with consequences. So uh, unmanageable loan debt creates financial barriers in front of big life decisions. So whether it's wanting to go and give back to the community and socially important, but historically low paying careers like being a teacher or social work, it's hard to do that. Uh, afford the salary of uh, uh, a starting teacher with unmanageable loan debt. And then also the ideas we associate with the American dream. So getting married, starting a family, saving for retirement, all of those things might have to be pushed back because of high student loan debt. We're also seeing just more students uh, uh, unable to manage their debt and going into default, basically hitting financial ruin. Um, and that permanently scars your credit history, making it um, harder to do everything from rent a home to get a job, um, and possibly much worse as you get older. Mm -hmm. So it, it matters. That, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so what can students do to minimize this uh, having to borrow in the first place? Well, I think, I think there's a lot, and it's not just on the student's part, uh, but from the student's perspective, the first thing you do is as you're looking for colleges, um, you know, whether you're looking for your first college or looking to transfer, you know, take a look. What is the bottom line cost that you'll need to pay to go to that school? How much are you going to get in grants? And then how much are you going to get in loans? So what is your out-of-pocket cost? Um, some schools are far more expensive than others, and it's important to know that because uh, you know knowing whether what your monthly payment's going to be once you graduate uh, is important. You need to know what the cost is to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second thing is just not all loan debt is the same. Um, so students should certainly prioritize getting grant aid first and scholarship aid, scholarship aid, then look at more affordable loan sources like federal student loans, and then only then look at other forms of student debt. Um, like uh, private student loans, which tend to be much more risky mm -hmm. um, and have less favorable terms and conditions. Okay, okay. So do you think the, the increases in available financial aid incentivizes uh, colleges and universities to increase tuition? No, absolutely not. So a number of studies have been done at the federal level looking at this, and there's just really no connection. Okay. Uh, most of the increases at, uh, in tuition is really just a factor of states cutting higher education funding. So many institutions are even working with the same budgets they've worked with for the past few years. They have not actually increased the amount they're spending. Uh, what's happening is the state just keeps pulling out more money, and that's causing tuition to go up. So it might seem as if you are paying more money, but the school's not actually, it's not any more expensive uh, to go to that school. So what really needs to happen is the state needs to maintain their funding uh, so that tuition doesn't go up. Okay, and, then, and I think you're kind of we're getting at that right here for my next question yeah. here. Um, so, like, what what should be done to make college affordable? 
Well, I, you know, solving the higher education funding crisis is, is a jigsaw puzzle, and there's many different pieces. First, you know, students and families can do a lot by making wise, empowered decisions about where to go to school and how they're going to finance their education. Um, the second thing is states need to ante up. You know, states need to make sure that they're maintaining, if not increasing, their investment um, in higher education in the state because that's how, you know, that's ultimately the cost of what students pay. Mm -hmm. But then the federal government needs to do more, too. You know, the Pell Grant program is the cornerstone of need-based financial aid in our country, giving uh, up to $5,550 every year to the most needy students. But while it's at its highest funding level ever, it's also at its lowest purchasing power ever. Uh, you know, the program, yeah, when the program was created, uh, it could pay for about two-thirds the cost of a college education. Now it pays for about 30, 30%. So the federal government needs to do more. And all of this, you know, some people just say we can't throw money at the problem. But, you know, really, at some level, kind of, that's, that's some of the solution. Um, other things uh, that folks need to do is, you know, the federal government can look at incentivizing states to maintain their funding. And I think we can also work to um, weed out some of the bad institutions, particularly in the for-profit uh, college sector. Um, your for-profit colleges now, uh, they educate about 13% of students, but suck up 25% of all federal financial aid. Wow. And now 50% of all students who default on the federal loan program went to a for-profit school. So if we're able to crack down on some of the bad actors in this sector, we can make sure students are going to better education, uh, better educational institutions, reducing their debt level. Uh, so there's there's a bunch of other ideas being kicked around, but there's just a few to start with. Okay. Oh yeah, great. Thank you. Um, now, is there any uh, is there a point at which college just simply isn't worth it financially for students? So it's always higher education is you know a great investment, and you need a college degree basically to be competitive in the 21st century. So students should not leave with uh, take a message that it's getting too expensive. But we as a society and as a state need to really look hard about the expectation of debt that we're placing on students and graduates. I mean, we need to make sure that, it, you know, graduates with high loan payments are going to find a way to manage it. But if that also means they can't save for retirement or their children's education uh, or even can't, you know, get married because of it, that's a larger problem that we need to address quickly. Definitely. So higher education is absolutely still worth it. Great. Okay, so now this one's a kind of maybe a tough one for you. Um, we'll see the is there is there an education bubble per se, as stated by critics, um, uh, in outstanding student debt. So yeah, the bubble is a is a buzzword coming from the mortgage crisis that um, unregulated banks made back mortgages, and it became this bubble where prices went so high, and then really the underlying product was toxic and faulty, and so the market corrected, lots of people losing out. Um, the thing with a bubble is the underlying product is bad. So in the case of the mortgage crisis, the mortgage. Um, a college degree is not ever going to be toxic. Um, so there's not really a bubble in higher education. Okay. Uh, it's still worth it. Um, the problem is, again, are we overloading, uh, oversaddling graduates with so much debt that it is becoming uh, a significant barrier to both economic recovery, workforce training, and just the livelihoods of college graduates. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time, Rich. Yeah. Thank you, viewers, for tuning in. Um, and remember, uh, you know, this is Michael Flannery signing off with MSCSA. Remember, show up, speak up.